I might be Pokemon Crystal's biggest defender, but even I can admit that it has its flaws. It's maybe not the most difficult Pokemon game, but can you beat it doing a hardcore Nuzlocke with only first stage Pokemon? Specifically, first stage Pokemon from three stage evolution lines in Gen 2. If I just limited it to first stage, we'd potentially have access to Scyther and other strong Pokemon. By adding the Gen 2 qualifier, we're knocking out options like Porygon, Elekid, Magby, Rhyhorn, and a few other solid options. They're all the first branch of a three-stage Pokemon line now, but in Gen 2 they could only evolve once. These are all of the Pokemon available to us, and even then we've got a couple of groups where there's no way we could get more than one. We can obviously only have one of the three starter Pokemon, and at best you're going to get one of Pichu, Igglybuff, or Cleffa. Just looking at what we've got on screen here, I would be shocked if you could actually guess who is the best by base stat total. I'll give you a second to guess, you can put it in the comments, but I probably won't believe you if you get it right. It's... Oddish. There isn't a single starter Pokemon with a higher base stat total than Oddish? Does that surprise anyone else, or is it just me? I guess I just don't think of Oddish as like a great first stage Pokemon, but apparently I'm wrong. Anyway, to add an extra layer of difficulty, we'll also not be doing any second chances. If our first encounter on any given route isn't a usable Pokemon, we don't get to try again. For example, on Johto's first route, there are four possible encounters during the day. We have just better than coin flip odds of getting something that works. 50% Pidgey and 5% Hoppit both give us a chance to add to the team, where 40% Sentret and 5% Rattata leave us with nothing. Other than that, we're working with standard hardcore Nuzlocke rules. No items in battle, no leveling beyond the next gym leader or elite four members ace, and you have to use the same number of Pokemon as your opponent in all major battles. I'm not sure that that last one is standard, but I like it, so it's standard for me. That feels like an incredibly long intro, so without further ado, let's get into it. We get our journey underway in New Barktown by selecting our starter. All three have their merits, with Cyndaquil especially being the only fire type available to us, but Totodile can learn Whirlpool, which could be key. If we fail to catch both Poliwag and Horsey during the run, then we'd have nothing left to learn it and couldn't advance past Dragon's Den. So we choose Totodile as our first partner Pokemon and nickname him Azulagarto. We can skip over the game's opening where nothing important happens for us and jump straight to our first encounter on Route 29. We went over the options for this one earlier, and as it turns out, that 1 in 20 shot at Hoppip comes through. The Grass Flying type could be pretty good, so let's add Sikorsky to the lineup. We're going to be going through a lot of encounters early in this video, while first stage Pokemon are all that's available. On Route 46, we win another coin flip, where 50% Geodude pops up first instead of Spearow or Rattata. Once he's been weakened, it's an easy capture to take our team to 3. Kumakavi the Geodude takes the third spot on the lineup before we head through Cherry Grove to Route 30. There's almost no chance we miss one here, with only 5% Hoppet being unusable, as we have one, but again, it's the most common encounter for us. Caterpie's another 50% encounter chance, and probably our first addition that can't really help us at all. Route 31's next, where we've got a 65% chance of finding Pidgey, Bellsprout, or Weedle, and once again the odds fall in our favour. This has been a lucky start. Wings joins the team, and already we're up to 5 Pokemon with a few encounters left before we even try the first gym. When we reach Dark Cave, we're finally fighting the odds with only a 39% chance of getting an encounter, but we're lucky again. Zubat overcomes the odds and beats a duplicate Geodude or a 1 in 100 Dunsparce to the punch. Sony makes for 6, and somehow we've already got a full team. As it's daytime, we can skip Sprout Tower and move on to our final encounter before facing Faulkner. On Route 36, we'll find a Dupes Pidgey 7 times out of 10, Bellsprout twice, and a Growlithe once. Only that Bellsprout would have worked, but we actually hit an unfortunate outsider in Growlithe to end our lucky streak at 5. Then it's finally time for the gym. Pokemon Crystal's Faulkner is widely considered the worst gym leader in history, and it's a title he wears with pride. A level 7 Pidgey without a flying type move, and a level 9 Pidgeotto packing Gust isn't the most threatening duo around. Given it's Gen 2 and he's the first gym leader to appear, you'd think something like Hoot Hoot and Murkrow would have been more interesting, but instead he's just completely reliant on Mudslap. Kumakavi the Geodude doesn't even get a look in as I spam the A button to select Rage 5 times and win. Good effort, Falky. There's a fairly long trek to Azalea Town after pocketing the Zephyr Badge, but nothing actually happened. We missed the 20% Bellsprout chance on Route 32, so with Union Cave and Route 33 having nothing available, we're moving ahead to Ilex Forest. Do you remember earlier when I said Oddish was statistically the best Pokemon we could have in this run? Yeah, well, I killed that chance by doing the Ilex Forest encounter during the day. 
Instead we end up with Curly the Weedle, who's approximately equally as useless as Kale the Caterpie. Curly is headed to the box where he will remain unless things go very wrong. We steamroll the Rocket Grunts camping out in Slowpoke Well, where we have no possible encounter, and then we can visit Bugsy in the Azalea Gym. The trio chosen for this one are just the duo who took down Faulkner and Wings the Pidgey. We're pretty well set up for this one with Kumakavi the Geodude, so I wasn't too worried about it. Wings easily knocks off Metapod with Gust before we switch into Kamakabi to battle Scyther. A miss almost costs us, but when he's one Fury Cutter from death, Geodude connects with a quad effective rock throw for the knockout. Magnitude 8 is then more than enough to take down Bugsy's Kakuna to hand us another fairly easy victory. As you might have expected, the battles will get harder as time goes on because the Pokemon we're facing will get better and better while our Pokemon can only stand still. The rival battle on the way out of Azalea is a quick one, so we can largely skip over it. Wings picks off Bayleaf to finish the battle and give us our first proper win over Silver. On Route 34, there's only one option available to us, and that's the 1 in 10 chance Abra. Of course, despite the fact that I can never find it when I want to, instead we run into the half as likely Ditto. Obviously, there's no two evolutions in Ditto's future, so that's off the cards, but we can pick up the odd egg in the daycare. There are seven potential baby Pokemon who can hatch from that egg, with their odds being all over the shop. There's a 19% chance for both Cleffa and Igglybuff, 16% for Smoochum, 14% for Elekid, 12% for Magby, 11% for Tyrogue, and just 9% for Pichu. So, as you'd expect, ours hatches Pichu, because sometimes math is dumb. It's probably the best result for us, although the base defense of 15 and the base HP of 20 doesn't bode too well. We miss out on our Route 35 encounter thanks to Growlithe, and then as we pass into the National Park it becomes night, which means we can no longer find it around male or female. So we'll have to wait till later for this one. That was the last thing we wanted to take care of before battling Whitney, so let's move on to that. It's probably to be expected, but once again Totodile and Geodude are the two chosen for the gym, because at the moment they do offer the most. Especially against Miltank. Clefairy goes down without really putting up any fight before Miltank and Geodude end up in a seemingly never-ending cycle. Milk Drink just keeps healing a bit more than Magnitude will deal damage, but eventually Kamakavi's persistence pays off. As it turns out, Geodude is pretty unstoppable in Pokemon Crystal's early game. It may have slightly screwed up our National Park plans, but now that night has fallen, we can return to Sprout Tower. During the night, Ghastly makes up 85% of all encounters there, so it isn't surprising to see it show up. Once we catch the ghost, we nickname her 8-Ball and then move on to Ecritique City. There's another battle with Silver in front of us before we can challenge Morty, so let's start there. Kumakavi, Zuligarto, Sikorsky, and Wings are the chosen four to take him on, and it ends up being a stress-free win. Totodile is too much for Silver's Haunter thanks to Dig, and also Curse. Geodude makes very quick work of Magnemite, as you'd expect. Sikorsky, whose typing is a great foil to Bayleaf, teams with Wings to knock out Silver's starter before one final rock throw eliminates Zubat. Definitely not much to worry about with Silver just yet, but we're getting into the game's tougher battles soon, starting with Morty and his Gengar. The only change we make to our team is replacing Zikorski the Hoppip with Sony the Zubat. Morty's Ghastly and Haunter No. 1 both faint without getting too much done, only really putting Sony to sleep. When Gengar enters the battle, he starts by using Hypnosis on Wings as well. That all but guarantees that Dream Eater's coming next, so we get a free switch into Kamakavi. As he's eternally clutch, his Hell Quick Claw pops allowing Magnitude to go first, and even though it's only a base 50 power Magnitude 6, a critical hit means it's a 1 hit KO. There's no need for a crit against Haunter number 2 though, as a base 110 Magnitude 9 demolishes it. Beyond deciding to go without a single Misdreavus in the Gen 2 Ghost Gym, Morty's biggest issue is certainly the lack of abilities. His four Pokemon really don't like ground moves prior to them gaining Levitate in Gen 3. Famously, Ghastly used to just walk around on the ground with its little dachshund legs. Once the sun rises, we're freed up to get a few more encounters. Mount Mortar gives us absolutely nothing as the 20% Machop refuses to appear, but the odds are back in our favor in the National Park. 60% of the time we'll encounter some form of Nidoran, and that's exactly what happens. Nidoran Female is our 10th Pokemon so far, but we're running pretty short on encounters in Johto now. With a free path to Olivine City though, we can now access the Good Rod, which means we've got a great chance to catch Poliwag. In the Ruins of Alf, there's a 65% chance of encountering Pop. oh, okay. That's the 35% Magikarp. That's fine though. We can still head back to Ecritique, where we've got the exact same odds, 65-35 in favour of Poliwag. Okay, well that's a bit annoying. I'm also not entirely sure why Magikarp is so intent on fighting fights it cannot possibly win, but fair enough. 
Right, how about Violet City? Identical odds here, 65-35, we couldn't miss three in a row, and we don't. Okay, that would have been pretty damn unlucky. After almost KOing the intestine forward tadpole with a crit, we catch it and nickname him Guts. Alright, that's it for encounters for the time being, so let's move on. It's not just the day-night cycle that we have to pay attention to in this run, but the day of the week in general. As it's Sunday, we can head to the Goldenrod department store and get the TM for return, which is nice. We could really go to any of Chuck, Price, or Jasmine next, but with the way we've set up level caps, doing them out of order would make this incredibly difficult. That puts Chuck's name first on the docket, and thanks to unskippable HM puzzles, we have to bring three Pokémon to face his two. Kamakavi is just here for moral support, though. In fact, it's our first big changeup in a gym battle with Sikorsky the Hoppip and 8-Ball the Ghastly taking center stage. We can return to talking about some of Pokemon Crystal's more glaring issues as Primeape and Ghastly start the battle because the movesets can be a problem. There's simply nothing Primeape can do against 8-Ball. It can use Leer, and that's it. We're at no risk in the opening half here because Chuck forgot Ghost-type Pokemon exist. Poliwrath's a different kettle of frogs, though. Not wanting to take a guaranteed hit on the switch into Sikorsky, we open with a Confuse Ray. That connects, but does nothing as Poliwrath breaks through to send Surf crashing towards 8-Ball. Poliwrath's a physical attacker though, and Ghastly's more of a special defender, and none of that matters because third stage versus first stage is always going to be a mismatch. 8-Ball enters the pocket of life's broken pool table, never to be seen again. She was so young. Well, let's be honest, getting through this without a death was never likely to happen, so it had been coming. As Poliwrath's confusion ended right when Sikorsky entered the battle, this is just a straight up one-on-one. -on -one. Hoppip does resist both Surf and Dynamic Punch, but with Hypnosis in play, this is far from over. Leech Seed and Poison Powder both land, the latter coming even with Sikorsky confused from Dynamic Punch. Before we can start using Mega Drain though, Poliwrath lands Hypnosis to put Hoppip to sleep. Sikorsky then proceeds to sleep through the entire battle while Chuck furiously instructs his muscly frog to just punch the sleepy cottonweed to death. Remember when I said Hoppip could be pretty good? This is just a teaser, this was without Mega Drain and Synthesis in play. Against certain Pokémon, Sikorsky can be a menace. After dropping the secret potion into Jasmine and Amphi, we head north to the Lake of Rage to take on the Red Gyarados. I was planning to just run, but as I should have learned from Magikarp earlier, they're not so into that. Luckily, even with Dragon Rage in its arsenal, Wings and Kumakivi combine to knock off the Shiny Serpent. Literally nothing of note happened in Team Rocket's Mahogany base beyond us getting the Whirlpool HM, so that's all getting skipped so we can move on to Price. The Elder Statesman of the Johto Gym Leaders has some pretty good counters for our team, and it's a second straight gym in which we can't afford to bring Geodude. Instead, it's Poliwag, Totodile, and Pichu making up our trio, so not the best looking team for Price. Luckily, it seems we found a Pokémon even more clutch than Kumakivi. Guts the Poliwag gets the battle started against Price's Seal and begins by hitting the 60% accurate Hypnosis. Then, on Seal's first turn of sleep, lands a… this is Gen 2, so 17 in 256 crit on Body Slam. Then, does it again! The odds of landing Hypnosis then hitting back-to-back -back crits with nothing boosting any of those odds is around 1 in 378. On turn 1 against Dugong, Guts succeeds with Hypnosis once more. We're now at about 1 in 630. Dugong then sleeps for long enough to allow Poliwag to hit 4 straight body slams, the last of which is another crit. The image of a Poliwag just springing up and down in an attempt to body slam a sleeping Dugong is very adorable by the way. It's really to be expected at this point, but Hypnosis lands again against Pile of Swine, and to add a cherry on top of the greatest performance in Pokémon battling history, Guts lands a crit on his second Surf to end the battle untouched. Going 3 for 3 on Hypnosis and hitting 4 crits in 8 attacks is probably the best RNG I've ever seen in a battle for one of my Pokémon. Usually that sort of luck is reserved for any Pokémon I'm up against. With the 6th gym out of the way, Jasmine's up next, and it definitely feels like we're better prepared for her team. In fact, we've assembled something of a dream team to take her on, with Kumakavi, Azulagarto, and Guts ready to battle. Two thirds of Jasmine's team really shouldn't be an issue for us, but Geodude takes two Sonic Booms from Magmite number 1 because he hits a magnitude 4. When Steelix comes out, we switch to Poliwag because Iron Tail could be problematic. Guts dodges it, of course, because luck is his weapon, and then counters with Surf. Jasmine calls for Sunny Day in a desperate attempt to stop Poliwag from two-shotting, but again, luck is his weapon. A critical hit wipes out Steelix and basically hands us the win. 
Not wanting to be completely outshone, Kumakavi finishes proceedings by landing a magnitude 10, which sorta of makes up for the 4 and 6 that open the battle. Honestly, Totodile's been around for a lot of our wins, but hasn't exactly played the biggest role. Clearly a great motivator though. Before we can travel to Blackthorn to battle Claire, we've got to clean up one last Team Rocket whoopsie in Goldenrod. This is just an example of how most of it went. Kumakavi learned Earthquake right at the start of their base and then proceeded to do more damage to the city than they ever possibly could. If there's one thing they need to learn, it's to not bring poison to an Earthquake fight. This section isn't totally devoid of challenges though, Silver returns for another face-off and this time he means business. Thanks to confusion, Kamakavi doesn't have an easy time against Silver's Golbat, falling below half health before eventually picking up the win with strength. Meganium enters the battle second and this may be our toughest challenge yet. Sikorsky manages to poison Silver's starter, but Body Slam poses a major problem. By switching around to allow Sikorsky in for every Razor Leaf and Kumakavi in for every Body Slam, we knock off Meganium without a loss, but we've taken a lot of damage. We did also do one switch out to Totodile to ensure Geodude remained above 20 HP, knowing we'd likely have to take a Sonic Boom. I sort of anticipated a Thunderbolt on switch in, but apparently it only knows Thundershock, so opts for Sonic Boom instead. Luckily that misses because I don't know what we'd have done otherwise, but the miss allows us the freedom to stay in and call for EQ. With 6 HP remaining, Kamakavi blows away Magnemite with an Earthquake. We switch to Wings when Haunter comes in knowing a Shadow Ball is likely, which forces Silver to go for Curse. That makes it an easy KO with Fly, leaving only Sneasel. We go out to Guts because we just don't have many great options left at this point and call for Body Slam. It's all very out of character, but Guts actually doesn't crit on any of his three body slams, although one does leave Sneasel paralyzed. Whatever the case, Poliwag takes down Sneasel to earn us another win over our rival, but it was far from easy. The rest of the Team Rocket section goes off without a hitch, so we can finally head east for Mahogany Town. We missed our Route 44 encounter, so there's nothing worth seeing until we reach Claire in the Blackthorn City Gym. By this point, Guts the Poliwag has learned Belly Drum, and knowing how fast he is, I thought testing it out was worth a try. I was pretty certain that we'd be seeing Thunder Wave first, so I gave Guts a Purr's Cure Berry before getting started. As it turns out, it's unnecessary as Claire's first Dragonair misses. That allows Belly Drum for free, and once Guts knocks off one level 37 Dragonair, you can be pretty sure the other two are soon to follow. When Claire's down to just Kingdra, I'm not too sure if we're still in one-shot range, so risk the Hypnosis, which ends up connecting. That turns out to be the correct decision as Poliwag's Body Slam comes up just short. When Claire pulls out a Hyper Potion to heal up, it's the beginning of the end. Guts decides it's been a little too long without a critical hit and ends things right then and there. One Poliwag just swept Johto's best gym leader without a super effective move. I fear Guts may be becoming too powerful. Once we've sped through the test in Dragon's Den and received the Rising Badge, we head back inside to get the Gift Dratini. I thought everything was normal at first, but when I checked Sudo's moveset, I noticed something confusing. He didn't know extreme speed. I started to doubt myself that this Dratini ever knew E-Speed, but apparently if you get a question wrong in the test, it knows rap instead. I have played Pokemon Crystal so many times, and I don't think I've ever got anything wrong in this test, so I was completely unaware of this, but I did misclick during speed up. I've already saved at this point, so let's hope it doesn't cost me. Back in New Bark Town, Professor Elm hands over a Master Ball, which feels sort of unnecessary with the Pokemon we're catching, but it's appreciated nonetheless. Then it's time for one final run-in with Silver. This'll be our first 6 on 6 against our rival, so nobody has to sit this one out. Kamakavi starts things off against Sneasel, and there's really no chance of it living a rock throw, so we begin with one shot. Meganium's up next, so it's time for our classic switcheroo strategy. Unfortunately, Body Slam paralyzes Sikorsky, meaning we don't manage to poison Silver Starter, so the bulk of the burden falls on wings. In the end, the flyer actually takes down Meganium without too many issues. When Magneton enters the battle, we get a free switch into Geodude, who promptly rips apart the magnets with Earthquake. Kadabra's up fourth for Silver, and knowing its defense isn't up to much, we stay in with Kamakavi and destroy more Victory Road with another Earthquake. It's a critical hit, which I don't think was needed, but after dropping one rock throw on Golbat, we need to switch. Kadabra did use Future Side, and Kamakavi probably isn't up to taking it. Azulagarto takes the hit before we switch into Pseudo to finish off Golbat with a Dragon Rage. Haunter's up last, and as Guts hasn't done anything yet, we switch him in for the final face-off. Two blasts of Surf get the job done to hand us another death-free win leading into the Elite Four. We didn't finish the battle in the best shape, but everyone's alive, so I will take it. 
While grinding everyone up so they're right on the cusp of leveling to give us the best shot in the Elite Four, we run into a shiny Rhyhorn in Victory Road. The arbitrary rules mean we can't use it, but this is mostly notable because it was the third shiny Rhyhorn I'd seen in a very short stretch despite not looking for them. Okay, now for Will. The first Elite Four member specializes in psychic types, and although the strategy is risky, we get the battle going with Hypnosis. Thankfully it connects, allowing Guts to follow up with Belly Drum and then Body Slam to wipe out Zatu. Poliwag's definitely faster than everything on Will's team, so we're in a very strong position now. A second Body Slam takes care of Executor, so we know Jinx won't stand a chance. Guts obliterates the ice… thing, which leads us into a bit of a dilemma. The extremely slow ticking down of Executor's HP suggested that was a close call on the one shot, so Slowbro's probably not going down to less than two hits. It's another risk either way, but we opt for Hypnosis and Guts rewards us once again. While Slowbro snoozes away, Poliwag bounces up and down on his belly until he's unconscious. That actually sounds quite violent. Zatu number two obviously doesn't bring any difficult questions along with it. Poliwag can freely body slam for the sweep, sending us on to Koga. I decided to use Rare Candy to keep everything at the level cap because the alternate options were not so good. Either we'd have to be severely underleveled throughout, or start overleveled to be on par with Lance. I figured this was fairer. We lead with Pseudo against Koga, but thanks to a double team, he fails to take down Ariados. A baton pass calls in Venomoth, who can't avoid a pair of fire blasts and faints. Koga's sort of working with us and calls Ariados back in, who's a free kill with Dragon Rage, and then brings in Fartress, which is perfect. It's got a quad fire weakness, which Pseudo can take advantage of, but anything else would have required a switch. When Koga sends out Muk, we switch to Kamakavi, who's pretty much in the clear at this point. Earthquake obliterates the mini Muk thanks to a crit, leaving only Crobat. Its only chance is to stall with double team and full restore, but Kamakavi isn't interested. Although he throws in a miss, Geodude takes down Crobat with Rock Throw to give us another deathless win in the Elite Four. This was a pretty perfect start. Bruno is up next. Gut starts the battle against Hitmontop, and a miss on Hypnosis sets us into a very frustrating circular disaster. Bruno calls for Dig, so we switch out to Wings, who isn't at all worried about Hitmontop. She manages to get off all six sand attacks while only taking one quick attack for her troubles. Of course, the turn we switch back to Guts, with Hitmontop's accuracy as low as can go, it connects with quick attack. We miss Hypnosis again, so Hitmontop digs, and can you see where this is going? When Guts gets back into the battle, Hitmontop misses quick attack, so we're somewhat back near square one. Hypnosis misses for a third straight time, Hitmontop digs, and the overall frustration of the endless loop causes me to make a pretty reckless decision. Instead of freely switching to wings, I call for Belly Drum knowing there's a 1 in 3 chance that Dig will connect and kill us. This was an awful decision. We aren't punished though as the 2 thirds chance comes through allowing Body Slam to Oko Bruno's first Pokemon. Hitmon's Chan and Lee meet the same fate, just without the 57 turns of ridiculousness. When Machamp enters, I know we'd be risking a lot by attacking, so trusting that we won't miss 4 straight on Hypnosis, call for that instead. It finally succeeds and turns out to be the correct decision as Machamp survives a body slam with a sliver of health remaining. A max potion prevents Sir from finishing off Bruno's ace, but it's just prolonging the inevitable. Body slam takes him down, leaving only an Onyx who stands no chance against Poliwag Surf. That's kind of another clean sweep for Guts, although its cleanliness can be debated. Karen's the fourth and final Elite Four member. Can we get through this without a loss? We lead off with Guts the Poliwag against Karen's Umbreon and get things underway by missing back to back with Hypnosis. Luckily we plan for Confuse Ray and Mean looks no worry so Hypnosis can connect on the third attempt. We follow up with the classic Belly Drum Body Slam combo which unsurprisingly Umbreon tanks. That blow wakes up the Evolution, who counters with Faint Attack, but it's not enough to KO Guts. Body Slam finishes off Umbreon, and for some reason Karen doesn't send out Gengar. Vileplume comes out instead, and she does not have the defenses to stand up to Body Slam, so it's another knockout for Guts. Unfortunately, Karen figures out the strategy at that point and sends in Gengar, which means it's time for us to switch. Wings does most of the work with Fly and Curse, but once Karen starts repeatedly calling for Destiny Bond, it becomes a bit repetitive. Eventually it runs out of PP though, so Wing Attack finishes the job. Murkra's entrance prompts a switch to Pseudo, who paralyzes the Dark type, allowing Kamakavi to score the knockout with Rock Throw. That leaves only Houndoom, and when Crunch doesn't take out Geodude, it's all over. Earthquake finishes off Karen to send us on to Lance, having not lost a Pokemon against the Elite Four. I really was not expecting that. It should come as absolutely no shock that we get the champion battle started with Guts. 
It seems Poliwag's days of being lucky have run out at this point though, as yet another hypnosis misses the mark. Thankfully, Gardo starts with Flail, which seems like a borderline insane strategy to start a battle, but I'm not complaining. That allows Hypnosis to land, and I'll give you absolutely no prizes for guessing the next two moves. Belly Drum and Body Slam combine to blow away Gyarados and give us an early lead. Neither of Lance's level 47 Dragonite can stand up to Body Slam, but when his Ace enters the battle, I'm afraid it will, so go for Hypnosis instead. We got our miss out of the way early, so this time it connects, and Lance's use of a full restore can only serve to guarantee the knockout. A back-to-back -back helping of Body Slam finishes off the Dragonite trio, leaving Lance with two. When Aerodactyl comes out, we've got a choice to make. There's no way we're one-shotting with Body Slam or Surf, but we do have a max attack Poliwag on the field. Our best chance of making it through without losing anything is to stay in, so we take a risk and Hypnosis pays off. With Aerodactyl sleeping peacefully, we're able to Body Slam then Surf for the KO. That leaves only Charizard. Having just seen the damage dealt to Aerodactyl, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that Body Slam will one-shot, so there's no risking Hypnosis. Charizard faints at Lance's feet, and the champion is defeated by a single level 50 Poliwag. Did anyone else know that Poliwag was this broken? It's kind of busted. There have been contributions from the whole team for sure, especially Pseudo at points in the Elite Four, but Guts and Kamakavi might be one of the best duos I've ever used. They're kind of incredible, completely exceeded all expectations I had going into this. Alright, just the one region to go now, but this shouldn't take as long. Anyone who has played Pokemon Crystal should know that 7 of the 8 Kanto Gym Leaders are a complete joke, so we can just skip over them. In fact, they're all under our current level cap, so they're barely worth mentioning at all. Let's just sort of speed through this. Kamakavi sweeps Janine and Surge, Gut sweeps Misty, Sabrina and Blaine, and even Sikorsky manages a sweep against Brock. Erika is the only one of the first 7 Kanto Gym Leaders that required more than one Pokemon to defeat. Wings and Sikorsky brushed her aside easily enough though. That brings us to Blue, the only gym leader this side of Mount Silver who even partially understood the assignment. Well, that's what I was thinking going into the battle anyway. As it turns out, Erika might be the best Kanto has to offer in Pokemon Crystal. Blue really has no answer to Guts the Poliwag who makes a mockery of his diverse team with Hypnosis, Belly Drum, Body Slam and Surf. I'm starting to think you might be able to beat the entirety of Pokemon Crystal with one underleveled Poliwag. I thought Blue would pose a real challenge, but maybe Red can slightly redeem Kanto? At least he's done his homework. By leading off with Pikachu in every battle, he's ensured that anyone using the Poliwag strategy is taking on a big risk. Instead, we opt for Kamakabe. Red's Pikachu deals a whole six hit points of damage before Geodude puts our lives on the line with an earthquake. One more cave collapse and we might be in trouble. Espeon's up next and starts with Reflect, which helps a lot as Kamakabe's death sentence continues. The first EQ doesn't do the job, but when Psychic can't one-shot Geodude, the second finishes off Espeon. That'll be all for Kamakabe, who's probably a bit too weak to take on Venusaur, so Sikorsky takes over. Hoppip's basically just there to wait out Reflect, and when I'm fairly sure we're about to see Sunny Day or Solar Beam, we switch into Wings. Fly deals a good chunk of damage before a countering Solar Beam nearly knocks Wings out of the sky, but the Tiny Bird comes out on top. Three down, three to go. When Blastoise enters the battle, we switch into Poliwag, who takes a blizzard fairly well. All we need is a bit of Guts' early luck to return, and Hypnosis connects so you know where this one's going. The famed Belly Drum Body Slam combination one-shots Blastoise. Red's penultimate Pokemon is Snorlax, who may seem big and tough, but its base defense is lower than a horsey, so it never really stood a chance against Body Slam. Charizard's up last, and we've read this script before. It didn't work for Lance, and it's not gonna work for Red. One final body slam brings the run to a close with a somewhat miraculous one death total. I really didn't know if this would be possible with all of the rules I set out at the start. I didn't make any big plans before going into it because I wasn't sure what I'd be able to catch. I knew Poliwag's speed could be a big benefit, but never anticipated how overpowered it could be with Hypnosis, Belly Drum, and Body Slam. If I hadn't taught Return to Pidgey, then it could have been even better. Both Poliwag and Geodude have base stat totals of 300, but they are absolute killers in this game. Unquestionably the two MVPs, but everyone played their part. If there's one thing I was able to teach you today, I hope it's that Chuck is the strongest trainer in Johto. That can't be right. Okay, bye!